with others and with this community. And indeed, as you know, with the world, it is a deep, deep pleasure for me to invite you here. For those of you who may not know, Dr. McCorvey was born and raised in Montgomery, Alabama. He received his degrees from the University of Alabama, Roll Tide, and uh, received the Outstanding Alumni Award back in 1999 from his alma mater. If I'm right, he's been at the University of Kentucky now for 25 years, is that correct? And uh, back in 1998, he received the Akron Award that's uh, given to one professor in the state who exemplifies excellence and innovation and creativity, and that defines uh, Dr. McCorby as he has served the university here. You know, he's been a teacher and a coach uh, to students far and wide. He's been an ambassador of music across this country um, and around the world. He blessed us uh, two weeks ago by being present with the American Spiritual Ensemble that he founded and directs, among so many other things. He is vice chairman of the Kentucky Arts Council. Best of all, he's married to uh, Alicia and they have three children, and David's with us today, but we want to welcome Dr. Everett McCorby this morning. Well, thank you. Uh, let's see. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and um, it's always fun when I can eat. I should just stop there. But, <laughs> But to eat with friends and uh, people that I have seen and known in the in the community, I've um, we've been in this community for we came here in 1991, and um, I came here from Knoxville, Tennessee. I was uh, director of the program at a small liberal arts uh, HBCU in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. Knoxville College is the name of the the uh, college and I was there for a couple of years before I came to UK and actually I was only at Knoxville maybe for three months when the job here at UK came up and my voice teacher at Alabama recommended me for it and um, I came up and interviewed and was offered the position and uh, but I felt like I just stirred the waters at uh, Knoxville College and so I took I turned the position down here at UK, and um, the dean at the time was Dick Domek, who uh, many of you know is a jazz musician and was the acting dean at that point, and uh, he called me a couple of weeks later and he said, well, Everett, what happens if we hold a job a year for you? Would you come next year? And I said, yes. And so I was able to stir the waters a little more in Knoxville and then get out of town. And, uh, and I came to UK and I've been here since 1991 and it's been an incredible uh, journey and I have enjoyed every minute of it. It's, um, our, our three kids were born here uh, and my wife was pregnant with our oldest when we arrived. And so, uh, so our first year of getting acclimated to Lexington was also getting acclimated to parenthood. And, uh, but it was a, a wonderful, wonderful time. And we, we make, have made so many friends throughout the, the, the city and throughout the Commonwealth. And so it's been a, a great joy to be here. And, it's very interesting as I go to different places, and many of you know I'm a member of First Presbyterian Church, and um, my wife sings over at First United Methodist, and so we we are we're, we're fairly around the city. But what I love about places like Central Christian is when I was in the congregation a few weeks ago, uh, the thing that impressed me so uh, is that not only do you see the people in the church setting, you also see them in the community. You, these are the people who are doing things, who are, who are you know, when you turn on, turn on the television, you see them being involved in different civic events, and different community events, and different causes. And so you're making a difference in the community, and that was something that was very important to Alicia, 
and myself, we wanted to be in a community where people were actively engaged in their community and people were actively engaged in making a difference in their community. And so um, we have been very impressed and uh, pleased about that. I grew up in Montgomery, Alabama, as many of you know, and um, I mentioned this the other day at the, at the service that my father was a deacon at the First Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, and he was a deacon where Ralph Abernathy was the, the minister, and actually Ralph Abernathy was the one who uh, ordained him a deacon, and my father is 93 years old, and he's still a deacon at, at uh, First Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. And I grew up in two churches. My mother was Methodist, so I grew up AME, African Methodist Episcopal. And that church was at the top of the hill, and then First Baptist Church was at the bottom of the hill on North Ripley. And um, so I would go to St. John AME from 11 to 12, because... The AMEs, they, they only go to church for one hour. <laughs> and uh, so then I would leave the AME church and go down the street to the Baptist church, and I'd spend the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> and, um, and so, but it, it was a rich uh, experience growing up in both churches because these were churches in Montgomery, Alabama, where the black leaders of Montgomery, Alabama were involved in the activities. Of course, when I was growing up, it was the Civil Rights Movement, and that was the main activity um, in, the, in the city, and my, my, my parents were very involved in that. I was, I was an only child, and so my father was very protective um, of me and in being involved. I had some older cousins and uh, my cousins were, were college age and a little older, and so I was always jealous because my dad, there was a small college in Montgomery, Alabama State University, Alabama State Teachers College at the time. It was one of the small black colleges in, in Alabama that trained teachers. We lived about a block away from that, and my dad had a store on, uh, right across the street from the campus, and so I grew up there. But I had a lot of relatives who went there, and so they would all either live in my house or hang out at my house or whatever. But my father was sort of the, the figure, the, the father figure for a lot of my cousins. He had, he had seven brothers and two sisters, and most of our family was educated at either Alabama State Teachers College or Tuskegee uh, Institute. And so Tuskegee is only about 35, 40 miles from Montgomery, and so... My father was like the, he was over all of the family, and they would come in, and he would let them do things, and he would never let me go. And I, I, I remember specifically when the Selma and Montgomery march uh, happened, I wanted to go. I was just, I, I, I mean, I think I was six or seven years old, but I remember wanting to go. And uh, my dad just would not let me go, and I cried and cried, but he let my cousins go to the, to the march, he wouldn't let them. Uh, he would let. He allowed them to go to the outskirts of Montgomery and march in with the uh, with the other marchers. And I, I remember watching it on TV, just wishing that I could be there. I had no idea of the historic significance of that. And uh, I remember when you know, the bus boycott. There were several bus boycotts. The one that you remember, of course, is the, the Rosa Parks. Boycott, but there were others that took place in Montgomery, and I remember my parents being involved with uh, the students from Alabama State were going to sleep in the streets so that the buses could not uh, roll down Jackson Street. Jackson Street was the main artery from Alabama State uh, down to Montgomery to the Capitol, and uh, and so they were going to sleep in the streets uh, one night uh, during the bus boycott. And I remember my parents being involved with getting, securing blankets from all of the, the people in the community. And I remember as a child taking those blankets up to Jackson Street and just passing them out to students. And students were going to take those blankets and just sleep in the street so that the buses could not uh, move. And um, there were so many memories of things like that that I didn't know at the time were were so important. I knew my parents were protective. They always wanted to know where I was. 
They always wanted to know uh, what I was doing because it was it was also very dangerous. And so, uh, and of course, with my father being at First Baptist, he was very involved with Ralph Abernathy. When and Martin Luther King lived right around the corner from our house. I mean, two uh, a block and a half. And I remember when I first took my kids to Martin Luther King's house, I said, this is where, you know, Martin Luther King lived, and they were like, yeah, Dad. <laughs> and, you know, it, the significance even wasn't until, to them until after they got a little older and realized that how, uh, how involved my parents were and how rich that experience was right in Montgomery, Alabama, and Jackson Street, right near Alabama State um, University. But my father was a... Uh, I was, as I was given my notes about uh, what to talk about today, who's the man or man who most influenced you in my life, in your life, I would have to say it was my father, because my father, although he grew up in that time, he was not an angry man, and he certainly had reasons to be angry, and I. I remember uh, as a child going, I had terrible problems with my feet, and so we had to go to, to an orthopedic on a fairly regular basis, and it was a white orthopedic, and so we, we could not go in the front door, and so we would have to go back in the back behind the bushes going into the, the door that was marked for coloreds. And I would ask my dad, I said, Dad, why are we going this way? And he would say, well, son, that's just the way it is. And that was his only answer. He didn't, didn't qualify, it, didn't say anything else. He said, son, it's just the way it is. And uh, he said, it won't always be like this, but this is the way it is now. And I remember going the back way to the doctor's office. And the thing that impressed me the most was when we would go into the office, you know, there were just benches and it was very land and you would knock on this window and then this lady would open the window and she'd pull it up and there was those old sort of bank teller windows with the little circle and I could feel the cool air coming through that little hole from the other side because the other side was air conditioned it was bright I remember these flowery Queen Anne chairs and it was beautiful and and so uh, we would still get to see the doctor, but we had to go in a different way. And that, has, that impressed me greatly for my entire career and my entire life, because it's something that I tell the students all the time uh, as they are working on their, um, trying, their desire to seek professional careers and to get to the Metropolitan Opera and to sing and, and all of that. And, and I, I, I tell that story a lot because I said that I got to see the doctor, I just had to go in a different way. And so I tell the students all the time that the way that you may get to the med is maybe not through the front door, but the hole looks the same on the inside. And so you just have to figure out what your door will be to get into that uh, hall. And, uh, I did have the opportunity to make my Metropolitan Opera debut, and I never forgot that uh, that story of me going through the back door to get to see the orthopedic. Um, I met my wife singing at the Metropolitan Opera, and we were married after two seasons at the Met. And um, and but that that experience as a child has stayed with me because. It was so influential in helping me to understand the way the world works. And my father was so such a patient man and such a giving man, and and he he, he still is almost to a fault. But I remember as a child also having dinner many nights, where after dinner we would have, well during dinner we would have guests and. You know, my dad would just be talking, and we'd just have a great dinner because my mom cooked, and it was a very traditional uh, household. My mother cooked um, every night, and you know, we had the you know two meats, three vegetables, you know, a couple of starches every night, and uh, and we would have guests come over, and and they talk, and 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 
they would leave, and I'd say, well, Dad, who was that? And he'd say, uh, I don't know. He said, you know, I met them at church, or I met them downtown, they looked like they needed a meal, and I brought them home. And this is the way my father was throughout my entire life. It drove my mother crazy. And it's so funny because my wife is the same way. It drives her crazy when I bring guests unannounced uh, to the house. But that's what I remember my father doing. And, and so he had such a profound influence on, on my life because he never allowed the situation to color his outlook on the world and his outlook on the possibilities of the world. I called my dad the night that Barack Obama became president. That was a very emotional time for me and I couldn't figure out why but my, my kids will tell you I was always sitting in front of the TV just crying and um, so I called my dad the night it was the night after it was he won the election and he was at the, maybe it was Grant Park or somewhere in, in Chicago where they had the big celebration and he was coming out and it was very emotional and I called I said dad did you ever think you'd see a black president in your lifetime and he says, well, son, I didn't even think I would see uh, the end of segregation in my lifetime. And that was, a, that was very, it was amazing to me uh, because um, it, was, it was something that I think really changed the world in a lot of ways to have an African-American uh, president. So under the, under the title of who... Um, who's a man who had a lot of influence on your life, although he did not, I've never met Barack Obama or, or been to the White House, um, but just his presence as president, the fact that our country could see past color to uh, elect someone to that office was very meaningful uh, to me. It's very distressful to me now the way the divisiveness that has happened in our country uh, since he's been president. But I know that those things go in cycles, and um, the right, the universe will allow the right thing to happen. I, I, I believe that. And so, um, so my mother was a, a school teacher. Uh, she was a librarian, and she in Montgomery, Alabama. I didn't go to an integrated high school, integrated school until I was in the seventh grade. Of course, you know the Brown versus Board of Education was late fifties, maybe, uh, and but uh, Montgomery didn't desegregate until almost ten years later. It was nineteen sixty-eight, maybe, uh, before Montgomery desegregated, and so I was in the seventh grade when I went to my first integrated school, and it was a scary experience. They did not want us there. Uh, we did not want to be there, and uh, my father waited every day at the same place. He, he dropped me off to school every morning. He waited at the same place, and he instructed me to come out of the school and head directly for his car and not stop. And I only stopped once after I was taunted and tried to get into a little fight, and my father got out of the car, grabbed me by the collar, and put me in the car, and we uh, left. And so he was very protective and, and just a very, very uh, sincere, honest man who always looked at the positive side of life. And I think that has really affected me because I, I'm always, I try to always be positive about uh, my life. I was in the third grade when one of the things we used to do is we also used to house young men who went to the local school, Alabama State, because there was not enough dormitory space. And the, uh, we housed six young men. We had three rooms, and we put twin beds in the rooms, and we housed them, and they attended Alabama State. And one of them played the trumpet. And I was going into the third grade, and I heard him practicing the trumpet. And I thought it was the sweetest music I had ever heard in my life. And I asked my dad, I said, Dad, could we, could, could we get a trumpet? I'd love to have a trumpet and learn how to play it. So he took me to the local music store, arts music store downtown. And um, 
we bought a, we rented a trumpet, and uh, he took me over to Booker T. Washington, which is the local high school for blacks. There were two in Montgomery, Booker T. Washington and George Washington Carver. And Booker T. Washington was just a, a block from my house. And so we went up there, and I had a, a trumpet lesson with the band director. And I, I say that it was a life-changing experience for both of us because I learned, I, at that moment that I had that trumpet lesson, I knew what my life's journey would be. I knew it would be music. Well, for my trumpet teacher, it wasn't so good because he died that night. It was pretty traumatic. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but again, my dad was right there. It was the first time that I'd had someone die on me like that. And uh, he took me through the whole process of going to the funeral home and, uh, and seeing Mr. Ellis was his name. And, um, uh, and I never took another trumpet lesson because I didn't want to kill another teacher. <laughs> so I taught myself how to play the trumpet. And so in the fall of the third grade, I was the only elementary school in the high school band. And, but I, because of that lesson, I really, I knew what my life's journey would be. I didn't know what, um, what path it would take, but I knew that being in music was what I wanted to do. And so we shared band uniforms with the high school, because it was a very poor school. And in Montgomery, if you didn't go to the two public um, schools, high schools, or elementary schools, then you would have to find a private school because there were no other public uh, opportunities. So Alabama State, again, a block from my house, the teacher's college created a laboratory high school so that the teachers who were trained there could then go to the lab high school to receive their training before they went out into the counties to teach because, again, the black students could not go into the white schools, so they could only go to Booker T. Washington or George Washington Carver. And so we had a lot of lab students who would teach us in the laboratory high school. Well, the laboratory high school had a band, and we shared the band uniforms with the high school band. So the high school uh, football team and the high school band would do their usual Friday night playing. And so we could use the uniforms, but it couldn't be on Friday night. Well, Thanksgiving Day came, and Thanksgiving Day in Montgomery is a really big deal because the two black institutions, Alabama State and Tuskegee, uh, play, have been playing for almost um, 100 years. And um, so there would be big parades on Thanksgiving. I was I had lunch with Eli Capilouto on Friday, and he was telling me about, because he's from Montgomery, Alabama, and he was telling me that as a child, his nanny used to take him to the Alabama State out mm -hmm. Tuskegee uh, parade. And he says as he didn't know he didn't know anything about racism or segregation or anything like that. He just knew every Thanksgiving that he was going to get to go to the Alabama State Tuskegee Parade. Well, it was a big deal in Montgomery. Well, I uh, came the day to, to, for the band um, to be chosen, the students to be chosen from the elementary school that would march in the Thanksgiving Day Parade because we had to share uniforms with the high school. So I was only in the third grade, so they said, well, sorry, son, you can't be in the parade, and they chose the high school seniors. They said, but any of you who want to march in your black pants, and your, if you wear black pants and white shirt, you can march. And you know, all the other students are saying, well, I'm not going. If I can't get my, in my band uniform, I'm not going to march in the parade. And I'm thinking, I want to march in the parade. <laughs> and so I wore my back, black pants and my white shirt, me and Eddie McLean. I, we were the only two. And uh, everybody else was in their beautiful uniforms, but I was in my black pants and, and I was just as happy because I knew my goal was to be a great musician. And marching in the parade was important to me because I thought that was important for my learning to be a great musician. And so I had blinders on. And so I put on my black pants and my white shirt and I went and marched. And so and I, I tell my students today, once you have a goal, then the rest does not matter. And so it did not matter to me that I didn't have a uniform. I had my horn, I had on clothes, and I marched. 
And so I started in the third grade learning my craft, and by high school, I, um, I was very proficient on my trumpet, and I changed the baritone horn, and there were people along the way who were mentors to me, men. My high school band director, my junior, imagine this now, black kid going in my, uh, growing up in Montgomery, Alabama, not going to a and going to a, a, a desegregated school in the seventh, seventh grade where it just so happened that my band director was black. And so he turned out to be a role model for me. And then I got to high school and my band director was black. And so he turned out to be a role model. Role models are important and in this in this culture, the reason diversity is so important is that we have to see people who look like us. And that's part of the problem that I see in a lot of environments where we don't have a diverse environment. So we don't have people who look like us. I wonder where I would have been if I had not had a person who looked like me to tell me, son, you can do it. And so, but I, it was a God thing. The Lord blessed it so that I could have a mentor who helped me to understand that if I had a dream that I could pursue it and then to tell me that I could pursue it. So I had black band directors. Mr. Duncan was my high school band director and, and he was the one who encouraged me to consider band, um, to be a band director. I wanted to be like Mr. Duncan. And so I, I, um, I joined the... I was in the high school band, and then I auditioned for the University of Alabama. And my dad was very, very concerned about me going to Alabama, of course, because George Wallace had stood in the door, and he felt that Alabama was not welcoming to blacks. And, um, but again, in my goal, in my path, I saw that the best university for what I wanted to do, which was music, in Alabama was the University of Alabama. And so I decided that I was going to go to Alabama, and it turned out I was the first black to graduate from the University of Alabama in music, and then it turned out the first black to receive my doctorate from the University of Alabama in music. And so, uh, but it was very important to me to continue that path and try to, to reach my goal of being a professional musician. So I went to audition at the University of Alabama, and I went to, and I didn't start singing really until I was in the, I sang in church in the Sunbeam Choir and places like that, but I didn't really, I sang a little bit, but not a lot. And um, by my, there was a lady named Mrs. Butler, and she, she sat in the pew right in front of me, and, and she would hear me sing, and she encouraged my mother to get me in the, the choir. And then when I was a junior, the church hired a gospel musician, and, um, and, and I said, I want to be in the gospel choir, and Mrs. Butler turned around to my mother, and she said, don't let that boy get in the gospel choir. It'll ruin his voice. <laughs> well, my mother said, okay, and I did not get in the gospel choir. During my senior year, Miss Butler died. <laughs> Something about the death of musicians, I don't know. Miss Butler died and I got in the gospel choir. <laughs> well, it did almost ruin my voice, and so I, I didn't understand the whole gospel thing. And, uh, but I went to college as a, 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 I wanted to be a music major, a band director, and the man who heard me sing my vocal audition was a man by the name of Bill Stevens. And you don't know Bill Stevens, but you know his prize student. His prize student was Jim Neighbors. Oh, wow. And, and uh, Gomer Powell fame. And, uh, and so Bill Stevens encouraged me to uh, pursue a, a singing career. And so actually I received my scholarship in singing. And so I played for one more year, and then I moved to, um, moved to singing. And I've been singing uh, the rest of my life. And so it's been a great, um, it was a rich growing up. And because of these mentors, I was able to move in the direction that helped me to become um, a professional musician. Um, I listed some other men who were influential in my life. 
Um, I've talked about my father and my, my uh, Mr. Duncan, my band teacher, my voice teacher at the University of Alabama, whom I stud I've studied with for, gosh, over 30 years. Um, he's 88, and I, I still go back for lessons. Uh, Martin Luther King was a um, big influence. And in history, I studied a lot of Abraham Lincoln. I think the courage and the fortitude that Abraham Lincoln must have had when he was not only as president, but in, in making the uh, decisions about the Emancipation Proclamation and, um, and the, the challenges that must have been in front of him uh, to make that um, decision. And as we know, Abraham Lincoln was a Republican in the Republican Party. And, um, and, and he was a very, I read about him a lot because his life was very influential to mine. John F. Kennedy was another one. Uh, John F. Kennedy came up, um, I, was, I was of course very young when John F. Kennedy was president, but I remember all of the important, I remember the night that George Wallace stood in the door uh, at the University of Alabama, and, and many of you probably remember that. That, that evening, uh, John F. Kennedy gave us, um, gave us, it wasn't a State of the Union message, but it was a special message to the country about how it was the right thing to do and that we as a country must come together um, and uh, fight racism and, um, and that this country should celebrate all races and all religions and all creeds. And uh, I remember that uh, message. Um, the next question was, tell us about a particularly difficult period in your life and how did your faith sustain you? I'll say that uh, growing up as an African American in, in Montgomery, Alabama was a very difficult period um, because of segregation, which I uh, remember very clearly, and, and I think that it has certainly dictated my, my work and my, um, my, my thoughts on so many things because I want my son, I want my children, I want my students to live in a very diverse uh, culture where they can see role models, they can see people that look like them, they can realize that we're all human, that we're all trying to achieve the same goal of trying to provide for our family, to try to be involved in our communities, and that each of us have a, a, an important part of that effort to make that, um, to make that happen. One of the challenges when I came to UK as a professor was that uh, and Tom probably remembers this, that you know, in the early years there were very few black professors. And when I came in 1991, I think we had probably, um, we had less than 30 uh, black professors then. And so one of the challenges, you know, and I had another professor who came in with me at the same time, and I, I would always notice that when the, the white professor went into the room, the professor would say, hello, I'm Dr. So-and-so. And the students would say, hello, Dr. So-and-so. And then I would go into a classroom and I'd say, hello, I'm Dr. McCorvey. And then they would say, prove it. And it was not, you know, it was just where they were and where the university was because the university had not really fully embraced diversity. And so the result was that the students didn't fully embrace diversity. And I remember uh, my first, uh, I met the young man who's now a press, he writes speeches actually for uh, Governor Bevan. I met him, uh, but he was a student when I was a, a freshman uh, teacher here and he was writing for the Kentucky Colonel. And he says, well, uh, I came here on the, affirm it was sort of affirmative action, I guess, um, um, Chancellor Hemingway had the, um, it was called the Minority Incentive Program to bring African Americans to UK. And um, the reporter said, well, how do you feel coming here on an uh, affirmative action uh, policy? And I said to the young man, and he reminded me of this when I, I met him a couple of months ago. He said, I said to him, well, affirmative action really only opened the door. I still had to walk through and I still had to prove that I could do what I said I could do. 
But what affirmative action did was it just gave people opportunities. And so it gave a diverse culture opportunities to go in and to prove that they could do, uh, they could survive. And so after, affirmative action didn't keep me there. It just opened the door. And, um, and so that was, that was a very uh, important time for me because uh, I knew I was qualified. I knew I, was, uh, I could do the job. But the federal policy just helped to open the door so that that um, could happen. Um, the last question was, as you look back over your life, what is one thing that you are profoundly grateful to God? Well, I'm grateful that God granted me a talent. I think that God grants each of us gifts. I think that's how God helps us to navigate through the world, is that God gives us gifts. And so it, God gives us talents. And our job is to find out what our talents are. I mean, you know, Harry's a banker. You know, that's his talent. Bill was an eye surgeon. That's his talent. Everybody has a talent. Everybody has a gift. Now, high school kids and college kids don't, all, don't always know what their gifts are yet. And so, and it's incumbent upon us as older, you know, seasoned people in the community to help our, help our students, our young people, to find out what their gifts are so that they can then achieve success in the world and make a difference in the world. But I think God gives us all gifts and then how we use our gifts are uh, really important. And so, uh, so I think that what God did for me was he gave me the, the talent of music. And because he gave me that, then I feel that my job is to share that music in all of this, its different forms with the world. And um, I'm, I'm certainly grateful to my family. Um, my wife is totally, totally opposite of me. And, and I guess that's a good thing because if I see red, she will see blue. And so it's, uh, so what happens is that it balances everything in our life. I'm certainly grateful to our family. And I'm grateful to one other thing, which is very, very odd, but about 10 years ago I was diagnosed with diabetes. And it was basically from me abusing food. And, um, and I think that God graced me with that so that I could take a look at myself, my health, uh, and do something about it. I lost 80 pounds. And, um, and the result is that I'm not on any diabetic medicine. Um, I just control it with diet and exercise. And so I see even that as a gift um, from God. And so it's been a, it's been a blessing for me to, um, to be here to share things that I do. And I, I just want to end with a couple of the different points that I live by. And I talk about these all the time to my students, and I'll share them with you because I think they're, they've certainly been my guides for life. The first one is enjoy what you do, because when you enjoy it, you're going to be nicer, and you're going to be more fun to be around, and you're going to, people will be, enjoy being around you. If you're doing something that you don't enjoy, you're probably not going to be very nice about it, and nobody will really want to be around you. And if you say, I wonder why I don't have any friends, that may be why. But um, enjoy what you do. The other thing I do, uh, one of my goals is always to surround myself with positive spirits. I mean, if I'm around a negative person, I don't stay there very long. Uh, I engage in all sorts of positiveness. And so I like to be around positive people who have positive attitudes and look at the world from a positive perspective. And so I call the other people energy vampires. <laughs> and I stay away from energy vampires because uh, they will take away your joy, they will take away your energy, and I will speak to them for a moment and then I will leave. And even with students, when I'm recruiting students, I look for positive students who I feel will make a, a contribution to the community, like Michael Priestley here, who I recruited from New Jersey a few years ago. 
ten, eight years ago, seven years ago, six years ago, uh, something like that. Uh, another point that I live by is to be patient and to be persistent. Uh, I, I remember my persistency from the child when my youth when they would not give me a band uniform but I wanted to march. And so that persistence has always helped me to achieve my uh, goals. The other thing that I do without ceasing is I pray. I say pray without ceasing. And I used to pray. My dad always used to say before I would go to college and when I come back, he would say, son, I pray for you every day. And I'd say, thank you, dad. And I really didn't understand that until I had a son. And then all of a sudden, I'm praying for him every day. <laughs> but I pray anyway, because, you know, I tell, I tell students that I can see to the corner, but God can see around the corner. And so God knows what's going to happen even before I know what's going to happen. And so by staying in touch with him through prayer, then I really do just turn it over to him. When there's a situation that I can't find a solution for, I know that he can find a solution for that problem. And so I just pray about it. And the more I pray, then these solutions just really come out of the heavens. And so I'm in constant daily, daily prayer. Another one is to know your strengths. I know what my strengths are, but you also have to know what your weaknesses are. So that if you're engaged in something that you know is a weakness of yours, then be aware of that and work on your um, weaknesses. Another thing that I talk about is not trying, do not do things that are not in your skill set. Some people, because of ego or whatever, they want to do everything. And some people aren't gifted to do everything. <laughs> and you have to find your gifts. I, I'll never forget, I was at a, uh, at a church service in New Jersey one Sunday, and the minister was talking about celebrating your gifts, and he says, know your gifts. And he says, well, I have to tell you, there are people who are not gifted in certain things. He said, there are people in my choir that aren't gifted. <laughs> I talk to myself, boy, I don't want to be in his uh, I don't want to be in his church next week because he's probably going to lose a lot of choir members. But I think we do need to know what our skill set is. So that then we stay in our lane and we do what's in our skills skill set. If it's if I don't have it, what I do is engage with people who have that talent or that gift in their skill set. So then if it's not in my skill set, I engage and collaborate people who have that uh, talent. And so that has always been very helpful uh, to me. Collaboration is a, a good thing. Um, at the very end of his life, I got to meet Alex Haley. And one of his great mottos was, find the good and praise it. And that's something that I have always tried to do, is find the good uh, and praise it. When I hear great singers, who I know sing better than I sing, I celebrate it. I celebrate their talents, I celebrate their gifts, uh, because we all have our own individual talents. And so we can celebrate the gifts of others. I've said already, stay away from energy vampires. Um, another thing that I do is I dream, listen, consult, pray, then act. A lot of times, we don't do the last thing, which is to act. Or we don't, or we act and we don't dream, or we act and we don't listen, or we act and we don't consult, or we act and we don't pray. And so what I try to do is to dream about something, listen to others, consult with others, pray about it, and then move forward. Um, I've already talked about staying focused on your, your dream, um, which it's always been very important to me to be good and to be kind to everyone. We're all trying to work through this world. We're all trying to do very, very similar things, which is to provide for our families, provide for our communities, live in a wonderful place where we can enjoy our lives. And it doesn't matter the color, people are all trying to do 
the same things. I've also known that God would not give me more than I could bear. Sometimes opportunities happen and I look at myself and I think, how in the world can I do this? And I'll just share with you that I'm, I've just taken over as the artistic director of the National Chorale in New York City. And it's a huge choral organization with a huge tradition of performing at Lincoln Center. And they perform with orchestras and they, um, at, at, you know, at the greatest concert hall in the world. And they wanted me to be their artistic director. And I kept thinking, Lord, why did you do that? That was not on my radar. You know, it was not on my radar at all. And I would always talk about it. And I was listening to Herman, who said he wanted to be an orchestra conductor. And in my life, I, I kept saying, oh, my next life, I will be an orchestra conductor. And I did not know that God had it in, in his plan for me to be an orchestra conductor in this life. And so, um, and so when they asked me to take the job, I said yes, because it was in my skill set. It just was not on my agenda. And, uh, but again, God, God's plans were so much bigger than mine. His ideas were so much bigger than mine. And so we can't, there are things that will happen to you that you can't even imagine that were not on your radar. But it was on God's radar. And so God had the, God had the foresight to see that you could do that and to challenge you to do that. And so this job in New York has been like that. So I left Sunday after our concert here at Central Christian, flew to New York that afternoon, started rehearsing the Verdi Requiem on Monday, and last Friday we performed the Verdi Requiem with orchestra, U.S. Soldiers Chorus, National Chorale, took some singers from Lexington, and uh, it was a huge event at, uh, in New York City. And so, if you just let God do his work, you do your work, and you work really hard to do the things that you're supposed to do, then God will take care of the rest, and he'll make things possible to you that you can't um, even imagine. And the last thing that I would say is every day I wake up looking for something good to happen. I wake up with a very positive attitude, and I feel that if I wake up, and I look for that positive, good thing to happen that God will provide and God will make it happen. So that's my uh, speech, and I'm sticking to it. And, uh, <laughs> but thank you all so much for allowing me. Before we get to your second up already today, thank you so much. Before we, uh, before we adjourn, one thing uh, about tomorrow, Pentecost Sunday, and uh, we're calling Restoration 200, which is a, a gathering of the disciple churches, the Christian churches, and churches of Christ throughout Fayette County, 3 o'clock in the afternoon over at the New Courthouse Square, and tomorrow's supposed to be a nice day. Thanks be to God for that. Central has stepped up in wonderful ways to volunteer and to help make this happen, and Steve Pruitt, one of our new members... Uh, has accepted some wonderful uh, responsibilities in terms of coordinating the volunteers at the last minute. One thing we have a need for, anyone in here in addition to Bob Hall that has a pickup truck? Anyone? Wow, Todd does it, and Jeff. Could you two see um, Steve right after this, Jeff and Todd? Because we're moving some rented chairs, not central chairs, but rented chairs over to Courthouse Square. Everyone's being encouraged to bring their own folding chair for that, but we're going to have some folding chairs over there. And after worship tomorrow, late worship, if you're able-bodied and uh, whatnot, to help move some of those chairs over, and we're going to be using Bob's pickup and maybe Todd and Jeff's if we could, to keep that, uh, keep that in mind. And also at 9.30 tomorrow morning, we're having an all-church uh, Sunday school class with representatives of what's called the International Stone Campbell Dialogue Group. Robert Welsh, many of you know, deep roots here in Lexington, and um, oh, Foster, Doug Foster, who is with the Churches of Christ, is going to be. They're going to be present and talk about the worldwide dialogue going on in our in our movement. So let me just leave you with a benediction that uh, Hank Snead had uh, brought to our worship team way back when from uh, Paul's letter to the Colossians. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved kindness, compassion, gentleness, and faithfulness, forbearing one another. If one has a complaint against the other, forgive one another as Christ has 
forgiven you, dwell richly in God's word, admonish one another, and above all else, put on love which binds together everything in perfect harmony, and sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs. Let all the men say, Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, son. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.